Good afternoon. Once again, hello. I am Yvonne Daniels. I am the afternoon host and content director or brand manager for KISS 107.1. It is one of our five stations here in Saginaw with Alpha Media. And I am just ecstatic and it's such a pleasure to be with you here today uh, to be the host for the first Go Red Talks in this area. So this is so exciting. And on behalf of the American Heart Association and the presenting sponsor, MidMichigan Health, welcome. So this event is Luke principles of other talk events where we're bringing together area leaders to give thought-provoking talks and spark conversations that matter. All presentations will be short and impactful, all right? So get ready. So what is Go Red for Women? Well, in 2004, the American Heart Association faced a challenge. Cardiovascular disease claimed the lives of nearly 500,000 American women each year, yet women were not paying attention. In fact, many even dismissed it as an older man's disease. Well, to dispel the myths and raise awareness of heart disease and stroke as the number one killer of women, the American Heart Association created Go Red for Women, a passionate, emotional, social initiative designed to empower women to take charge of their heart health. So for many years, we've held a Go Red for Women luncheon in the area. In fact, the committee is already meet, at meeting to discuss uh, the February 2022 event, yay. Uh, so nationally, more than 900,000 women have joined the fight. Uh, women who join Go Red for Women receive important information that allows them to take action to improve their health, so important. So let's learn about some of the benefits. Well, 91% of women involved in Go Red for Women visited their doctor in the last 12 months compared to 73% of all US women. 64% follow a regular exercise routine. 90% have had their blood pressure checked in the last year. 75% have had their cholesterol checked in the last year. And because of the work for of Go Red for Women, uh, positive things are definitely happening. Passionate stories are being shared and changes are taking place. And, and that's what it's all about. So today we're gonna delve into some of these topics in more detail. If you hear something that inspires you, we know you will, please share your experience on social media using hashtag Go Red Talks with an S, okay? All right. The American Heart Association also has a large focus on stroke issues. Uh, coincidentally, May is Stroke Awareness Month. Uh, we asked Tammy Albrecht, to tell us about her work and what we should know about this issue. Now, Tammy is currently the Neuroscience Services RN Manager for MidMichigan Health. Tammy obtained her Master's of Science degree in nursing from Grand Canyon University in Phoenix, Arizona. She currently oversees the health system a stroke program that includes the primary stroke center in Midland. Now, Tammy has more than 10 years of experience working with the stroke population. Uh, during this time, she developed a, a robust community outreach program, rural telestroke and teleneurology program that has a passion for preventative medicine that led to the development of this talk. So welcome, Tammy. Thank you for taking the time to join me today. My name is Tammy Albrecht and I'm the Neuroscience Services Nurse Manager for MidMichigan Health. And the topic today is understanding stroke, and more specifically, stroke in women. When we say stroke, what we really mean is a brain attack, right? And the brain supports all functions of the body. So depending on how severe the injury to the brain and what part of the brain is affected, symptoms and outcomes can vary. While we all know strokes can happen to anyone at any age and vary in severity, type, cause, and effect, women and men are so very different, and their signs and symptoms and risk factors for stroke are as well. So my mission here today is to wake women up to the fact that stroke is a women's issue and we can be part of the change and not the statistic as 80% of all strokes are preventable. Stroke statistics. When we take a look at stroke data, we see stroke is now the fifth leading cause of death in the United States, with, which is roughly one in every 18 people. And while we have moved the dial when it comes to mortality, as just a few years ago we saw stroke as the third leading cause of death, what is more staggering is that we still report that two thirds of all stroke survivors have serious long-term disability and one in five of them are not able to live at home after suffering from their stroke. Unfortunately, we've also seen a 50% increase in teen and young adult strokes in the last 10 years. And as of today, about 15% of all strokes occur in this population. We see this occurring in parallel with increasingly prevalent risk factors, most of which are based on lifestyle choices such as pregnancy, contraceptive use, excess alcohol consumption, low physical activity, and cigarette smoking, to name a few. 25% of all strokes are recurrent and end in worse functional outcomes. 
While the first three months following a stroke, or mini stroke, which we call TIAs, is prime time for a recurrent stroke, the risk of recurrent stroke within the first year is 15 times greater than for the general population. For someone who, who survives a stroke or mini stroke and is initially free of complications, the risk of experiencing another stroke, dying, or requiring admission to a care facility is doubled for up to five years following the initial stroke. Now let's break down the stroke data and look at what the numbers look like for women in stroke. You know how we talked about stroke being the fifth leading cause of death in the United States? Well, stroke is the fourth leading cause of death in women in the United States. That means about 425,000 women suffer from stroke each year, which is roughly, roughly 55,000 more than men. About 60% of all strokes suffered by women will end in death as opposed to 40% of all male strokes. And to keep this in perspective, this doesn't just mean you have a stroke and then die. We're including those who suffer serious disability and eventually succumb, could be years, as a result of their stroke. If we look at African-American women, stroke is a third leading cause of death as they suffer from a significantly higher number of strokes due to risk factors. Now, that being said, they are also less likely to correctly identify symptoms that cause a stroke, risk factors associated with stroke, and oftentimes do not seek immediate medical attention, comparatively speaking. Overall, the lifetime risk for women in stroke is one in four of us. Surprised? You're not alone. Many women do not know their risk of having a stroke, and while the facts are alarming, there is good news. Four in five strokes, or 80%, are preventable. Now, let's go back to stroke being a woman's issue. Number one, that more women than men have and die from strokes. Stroke disproportionately affects women. Women's bodies are not the same as men, and stroke affects them differently, and they are at higher risk at key stages in their life. And we also know that this is partly due to women living longer than men. Number two, twice as many women die from stroke as they do breast cancer. Today, only 27% of women can name more than two of the six primary risk factors. 70% of women have no idea they are more likely than men to have a stroke. Number three, more women than men are stroke caregivers. The sudden nature of the disease often leaves families unprepared to deal with consequences, which include psychological and financial burden, along with the required physical care, which all culminate into excessive stress. This stress often leads to negative symptoms such as depression, anxiety, fatigue, social isolation, and major relationship issues. Lastly, number four, women take much better care of others than they do themselves. Studies have shown fewer women seek early medical attention, we know that time is brain and there's a very short window of opportunity to be treated for a stroke. Women also do not participate in clinical trial and research studies like men, and we tend not to identify with some of the more subtle symptoms that women can suffer from than men. So that brings us to discussion about the overall impact of stroke. As I already mentioned, stroke is a leading cause of serious lifelong disability, but is the number one cause of serious lifelong disability in women. Some of the more obvious include physical deficits, which affect motor control, such as our body movements. There may be paralysis, swallowing difficulty, or even balance issues. Many strokes affect the ability to speak intelligibly or express thoughts, and we know how frustrating it is when we try to get others to understand us when we communicate effectively. Imagine not being able to get your point across at all. We often see loss of sensation to touch, temperature, numbness, loss of bladder and bowel, and also chronic pain syndrome. So what does the burden on women really look like? Life after stroke brings about so much fear, anxiety, frustration, anger, sadness, and depression is very real. Women are already twice as likely to suffer from depression than men, and the number goes up when stroke is involved. Fewer women return home following their stroke, and more women end up in long-term care environments than men. More women suffer from marriage breakup post-stroke. That is when it's the woman who's had the stroke. The women tend to stay with the men who have suffered from the stroke. Two-thirds of all stroke caregivers are women. Women provide more unpaid caregiving support, and an estimated 30% of them are family caregivers. Women caregivers spend 50% more time providing the care a male counterpart would. The demands of caregiver time are so substantial. The data shows that 33% of working women have to decrease their hours, 29% pass up job promotions, training, or assignments, 22% of the caregivers take a leave of absence, 20% switch to part-time, 16% have to quit their job, and 13% are forced to retire early. So you can see why women caregivers suffer from financial difficulties, social isolation, and are largely sleep deprived. The burden on women is real, but 80% of strokes are preventable. All right, so we've talked lots of numbers about our chances of having a stroke and dying from a stroke and having serious long-term disability from stroke. Let's talk about the ABCs of stroke prevention. A is for aspirin or anticoagulant. Often taking an aspirin as directed by your healthcare professional can significantly reduce the risk of having a stroke. B stands for blood pressure. Control your blood pressure. High blood pressure increases your risk for both heart attack and stroke or brain attack. 
Find out what your blood pressure numbers are and ask a professional what that means for your health and stroke risk. C stands for cholesterol. Cholesterol is the waxy substance produced by the liver and in certain foods. Your body needs cholesterol, but when you have too much, it can build up in your arteries and cause disease. There are different types of cholesterol, both good and bad. The good cholesterol can protect your body, where the bad cholesterol can increase your risk for stroke. If you do not know your cholesterol levels, reach out to a healthcare professional to get tested. And lastly, S stands for smoking. And we all know that smoking is bad for you, and it does significantly increase your risk of having a stroke. So how do we as women move the dial when strokes are 80% preventable? While some risk factors are outside your control, like race, age, and gender, there are many you do have the power to control, and we'll take a look at those six main risk factors now. Cholesterol, we've already talked about as part of the ABCs. We must know our cholesterol levels, low-density lipids and triglycerides. We work with our healthcare professional to help us help ourselves. Maybe we need to watch our fatty diet, which is not another of the six risk factors. Maybe we need to be on lipid-lowering medication. High cholesterol puts us at significant risk, as this usually doesn't cause symptoms, and many otherwise healthy people do not get regular well checks. Blood pressure. Knowing your family history is important, as this puts you at higher risk. Other factors include unhealthy diet, lack of exercise, and obesity. To lower your risk of stroke, try to lower your blood pressure to less than 120 over 80. The 120 or systolic represents the pressure as your heart is beating or pumping blood, and the 80 or diastolic is the pressure when your heart is at rest. Smoking. Quit smoking or do not start. There are many smoking cessation products out there to help if you're struggling. Smoking increases your risk of having a stroke by up to four times that of a non-smoker and does so in several ways. Number one, it causes your blood to thicken and be more likely to clot. It can cause plaque buildup in the carotid arteries, which is a major artery that supplies blood to the brain. Nicotine raises blood pressure, and the carbon monoxide reduces the amount of oxygen your blood carries to your brain. Also worth noting, women who smoke and take hormonal birth control are at a significantly higher risk of having a stroke, especially when over 35. One of the six risk factors we haven't touched on is diabetes. Women with diabetes are more likely to die after a stroke than men with diabetes. Having uncontrolled diabetes can damage your arteries and also make you more likely to have high blood pressure. About 25% of people were completely unaware they had diabetes when they were initially diagnosed. Inactivity equals overweight equals increased chance of stroke, especially when weight is carried around the waist in apple-shaped people rather than hips and thighs in pear-shaped people. Overweight, postmenopausal women are also at higher risk. Exercise and activity can actually help us address almost all other modifiable risk factors and lead to improved weight, lower blood pressure, improved diabetes, and lower cholesterol levels. Okay, so we've talked about what stroke looks like today, how we can identify with our own specific risk factors, but we haven't talked about what happens when we become part of the statistic and are having a stroke. We use a mnemonic or work association, BFAST. BFAST helps us to identify some of the most common stroke symptoms to watch for. B is for balance, a sudden loss of balance. E is for eyes, have you noticed a sudden loss in vision in one or both sides? F is for face. Is there a sudden noticeable difference from one side of the face to the other, such as a droop? A is for arms. Is one arm weak or numb? S is for speech. Is there a sudden onset of slurred speech or inability to speak or a new level of confusion? And T is for time, and by far the most important thing to remember when you notice a sudden onset of any of the stroke symptoms listed above. Call 911. Stroke is a time-sensitive medical emergency. Do not take yourself to the hospital. EMS and paramedics are trained to identify, manage, and help facilitate quick response for treating strokes. The quicker we can get medical attention, the better our chances for a full recovery are. We've discussed the more women knows about her specific risk factors and about the signs and symptoms of stroke, the more she can focus on prevention. Women are really encouraged to schedule cardiovascular screenings beginning at age 25 to address risk factors, and MidMichigan Health offers a great way to get started on your path to a healthier you by offering a free quick stroke risk assessment. You can also reach out to stroke specialists via the email provided should you have additional comments, questions, or concerns about stroke and you. Lastly, thank you for attending this talk. And in summary, remember, a stroke is a brain attack, which is a time-sensitive medical emergency. It's important to know both the warning signs and how to manage the ABCs of stroke prevention. And remember, healthy habits are important, and 80% of all strokes are preventable. Thank you so much, Tammy, for that uh, information on stroke. And I heard you say it uh, about three or four times, and, and it bears repeating one more time that 80% of strokes are preventable. So that is such great news. Uh, thank you for giving us the warning signs, the preventable ways uh, that we can 
can can act and things that we can do to prevent this from happening. And it's very helpful to also know that we have to act quickly uh, in the event of a suspected stroke. So thank you so much once again, Tammy, for that. And to let you all know that are watching, thank you again so much for being here. If you'd like to ask a further question of any of the speakers today, uh, feel free to add it to the chat box, okay? It's right down below. And you can even select to send your question to just the panelists if you'd like. Uh, if we're not able to answer your inquiry, we'll go to reply for uh, via email later. So definitely know that that is possible, okay? Our next talk is focused on social determinants of health and how it impacts the health of those in our community. Now, Bonnie Hardwick was in family medicine prior to coming back to Covenant Healthcare. She has done transitions of care for heart patients for the past nine years and health and wellness prior to that, at which time she was able to get her certification in wellness coaching. Now, all combined, her current position with the Heart Failure Service is a perfect fit, uh, whether doing bedside education or coaching the patient and or family members to reach the goals they choose to meet. Uh, Bonnie, we are looking forward to your comments. So take it away. I was asked to do this session on social determinants of health. While I was preparing for this, I asked some of my colleagues and some of our other non-clinical staff at Covenant, what do you think about when you hear social determinants of health? Now, some of you in the audience may be familiar with that term, while others may find it to be a bit more complex. And you might even have the same response that several of our, our peer, my peers had. One said, well, I guess I'm not familiar with it. It means something that would benefit others, or it may be determined by race, income, geography, one said, I really don't know. So what is it? So the World Health Organization defines social determinants of health, and I quote, the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. These circumstances are shaped by distribution of money, power, resources at the global, national, and local levels. It can include food insecurity, violence, substance abuse, transportation needs, housing, medication management, and quality of medical care. So what impact does it have on us as a hospital or even as a community? Let me tell you about Ben. Now I've changed all the names in these examples. In fact, I'm using my son's name with his permission. So Ben was hospitalized for his heart failure. He is in his early fifties. He's very charismatic smile and he seemed eager to learn more about his congestive heart failure diagnosis. I was asked to meet with him at the bedside to provide education on his low sodium diet, his fluid restriction, his daily weight, his medication management, all of which are a part of his medical management for when he leaves the hospital and returns home. This is something that I do every day and I don't take it lightly because every patient is an individual with individual needs. So I assumed that he would be returning home to the address that was listed in the demographics on his chart. Well, during this educational session, it was revealed to me that Ben lives in a homeless shelter. He doesn't have access to a scale. He eats the food that's provided by the shelter. He drinks his fluids with his meals and his medications are locked in a safe place and they're distributed by the staff. Wow, I had to quickly switch gears with his educational plan. We assume that all patients are going to follow the recommendations of the plan of care when they leave as we've outlined for them at discharge. The education was clearly explained to Ben and he verbalized understanding. So now is that the end of my responsibility? We as clinicians know health outcomes are affected by the patient's conditions outside of the clinical walls, but we must approach care of the medical needs 
as well as the non-medical needs. Social determinants of health are influenced by policies and programs that have proven to better health outcomes. For example, tobacco use is a leading de uh, determinant of many health outcomes, including mortality and quality of life. So what are the policies that have been put into place? We now have no smoking zones in public places and the cost of cigarettes is nearly prohibitive for most people. Or think of the increased number of safe walking spaces and trails that are available to us as the result of increased um, activity at the local and national level Community gardens and farmers markets are available to access healthy food. So let's go back to Ben. His story doesn't end at the homeless shelter. Because of the changes at the local and federal level, social services have responded to the non-medical needs of patients, such as transportation, housing, food insecurity, with the assumption that outcomes and costs will improve the client's lifestyle and in turn their medical needs. Ben is now living on his own in an apartment because it is the assistance of the Housing Development Authority, but he's come back to the hospital with another episode of congestive heart failure precipitated by his cocaine use. One of the determines determinants that affects his medical condition. Ben admits to knowing he should quit cocaine. In fact, he had been clean for nearly two decades. His goal is to quit the use of cocaine, but he declines inpatient or outpatient rehab because he can simply do it on his own. He tells me he continues to struggle with that low sodium diet, finds it challenging to read the food labels, and eats most things that he can warm up in his microwave. He can walk the five blocks to the pharmacy to get his medications, but he relies on public transportation for other errands and appointments. He enjoys helping a buddy with small jobs. This time, the discharge process is a bit more challenging. He now needs two doctor's appointments as well as outpatient lab work post-discharge. Now his primary care provider does provide transportation to and from his appointments at no cost to him if he makes those appointments 72 hours in advance. He's motivated during this admission and he does schedule his own transportation appointment. But now we've also scheduled him for that cardiology appointment and his medical insurance provides transportation. This is another program that's in place at the federal level to assure there's no barrier to keeping appointments with physicians, labs, x-rays, et cetera. Once again, Ben needs to call 72 hours in advance to schedule. I receive a call from Ben 48 hours before his cardiology appointment and lab appointments requesting assistance with transportation. He cannot find his insurance card in which the transportation number is listed. He tells me he does not have access to the internet service to look it up online. I pick up from there. After calling three separate numbers for the insurance that's listed online, I'm connected with a representative and placed on hold for seven minutes. I can schedule the ride to the cardiology office but the lab test that needs to be drawn on Saturday morning after 10 o'clock. The insurance company doesn't have a driver after 10 o'clock in the morning. The, it was then recommended that he take the bus and that they would reimburse him for the bus trip. The representative looked at the bus routes and discovered, oh no, there's no bus route that goes by his apartment. She then says, recommends taking the cab. Once again, they'll reimburse him the cab um, amount that he would need. 
While understanding this patient would need to cover the cab fee up front, I suggested maybe we do an alternate date for his lab work that would accommodate their transportation schedule. The representative told me she'd locate a driver before 10 o'clock in the morning. In my role with the Covenant Heart Failure Service, I help navigate patients through the often complex and fractured pathways. It may be through education or listening and coaching patients to set goals and to make the healthy choices be the easy choices. Sometimes it's facilitating appointments, calls to pharmacies, calling caregivers, or helping assist patients set up their own medications, which can be very foreign to them. Or it may be asking the very sensitive questions in a caring, non-judgmental way to open opportunities to support that patient. For example, do you read? This reminds me of Ted's story. At the time of discharge, he had asked that his significant other be present for the medication review because she managed his medications at home. It very soon became apparent to me that neither of them were able to read. Off I went to get colored stickers and together we placed yellow stickers on his morning medications, black stickers on the night medications. Well, you get the picture. By taking time to meet the patient at his needed level of care, we were able to empower them to self-manage his medications. Studies suggest that health behaviors such as smoking, diet and exercise, social and economic factors are the primary drivers for health outcomes. Patients with unmet social needs have up to 10% higher annual expenditure. Great advances have been made through programs like REACH, which is a national program aimed at reducing racial and ethnic disparities in health. There are programs to address health disparities faced by people with disabilities. We have national programs to eliminate diabetes-related disparities in our vulnerable populations. There are programs that advance care cancer prevention early detection and treatment, to name a few. The American Heart Association is working to support hospitals in several ways as they address social discriminant disparities to help eliminate healthcare disparities, including medical and legal partnerships, improving health and well-being through activity and healthy eating, addressing violence in many forms, whether it is in the workplace or in the community. I trust that this has given you, our community, a more panoramic view of the medical and social determinants as well as, well as the available resources in our Saginaw community. Good health is not something you can buy but it might prevent you from landing in a bed and being the recipient of an education session with me. I like how Walt Disney said years ago, the way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. Thank you for attending with us today. Bonnie, man, uh, you show that we are definitely our brothers and our sisters keeper. And we just thank you uh, for the tenacity and the care that you show. You hear it in your voice. And wow, we just thank you all because there are so many barriers and you have shown that. Um, but you are helping to break those down uh, for better health care outcomes for everyone. So thank you so much. Once again, we appreciate you. So, uh, wow, I'd like to introduce you next to our speaker who is here on the very relevant topic of mental health and wellness. Megan Dahl is a licensed master social worker. She works as a behavioral health therapist in the Mid-Michigan Medical Center, a Midland Psychiatry Department. 
In her role, Megan meets with clients both in person and virtually to process the stress of daily life. And she helps them practice the coping strategies to manage their challenges. Uh, she has experience in working with a variety of health concerns, including severe and persistent mental illness, chronic physical illness, pain, and dementia. Uh, Megan has also been leading community presentations on the topic of loneliness and how to cope. And of course, we know during this time, wow, that uh, is so, so many more people now. So let's welcome Megan. Well, thank you so much, Yvonne. I appreciate your uh, having me join today. So as uh, she said, I am a behavioral health therapist in Midland. And so I was asked to talk about uh, mental health and wellness today. And May is also Mental Health Month, and so it's an appropriate topic. Um, mental health and wellness is a topic that covers a lot of ground. And so I wanted to specialize the talk today to talk about loneliness specifically. Uh, there is definitely a connection between our physical and our mental health. Often we call that the mind-body connection. So if one is feeling well, then it affects the other positively. If one is feeling unwell, it affects the other negatively. And so there's ways that we can help our physical health by helping our mental health. Loneliness is a very hot topic right now. And so this is uh, actually, it's a, a social determinant of health as well. We just heard from Bonnie about different types of things that can affect our health and uh, loneliness is one of those. And so we want to take a look at how we can start to affect this in people. We actually teach um, in Midland a five week course on this um, that we do virtually. So I do encourage people if they're willing, uh, willing uh, to join us that we will really get into in depth on these topics. And so the, the main takeaway for today, um, sorry, I'll just have us back up one slide here, uh, is that loneliness is curable. My husband always bugs me to get to the point, Megan. So here's the point for you. I'm just laying it right out there. Loneliness is curable. And this is a hard concept sometimes for us to understand because especially for those folks who have been chronically lonely, uh, it is really hard to understand how we might change that because people have already tried. Um, but it is a we are able to do this. It's not necessarily simple or quick, um, but definitely we have tools to do that. Um, so I wanted to just put that out there um, for the group to understand. So in the news, uh, you will find lots of types of uh, articles on this. Now, there's lots of studies that are out there to look at the effect of loneliness on our health. Um, so these are just some examples of some headlines that you might see, uh, but I definitely encourage you to, to look it up if you're interested more. What we know about health is that loneliness, when we study this, has the same effect as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And so I know we've all kind of heard in our uh, physician's appointments that, you know, smoking will negatively affect our health. Well, loneliness does the same thing. And so we have to take a look at it if we're looking at ways to improve our health and well-being. Uh, so you'll see in, in these different news articles that it affects different types of groups. The group that we're running in Midland is focused on older adults and loneliness, which is definitely a hot topic now with the pandemic because older adults are more likely to be isolated. But it can affect a variety of people and it especially affects people as well who have health changes. And so if folks are going through issues with their heart health uh, that change their lives in some way, change their activities, or perhaps there's a transition change that can affect their loneliness level. And so we, we want to keep an eye on this as we're going through managing our physical health as well. So one of the things that we want to do first is to define it. And I'm sure people have heard the term loneliness before, but it is important for us to understand the difference between loneliness and social isolation. So loneliness is an emotion. It involves sadness or distress, uh, feeling disconnected from others, uh, or being by ourselves. So the idea of this is that you feel loneliness, but you can be in a crowded room. So there's an image here of this woman who's in a, around a lot of people. It doesn't matter how many people are around you. Loneliness is the feeling that you're alone, that you're disconnected. 
Social isolation is the state of being separate from others. Uh, so this is going to be uh, just the situation that you're in. And so both of these things could be happening at the same time. They definitely influence each other, but sometimes people are lonely, but they're not isolated. And so we work on changing their perception. Of course, if isolation is also in the picture, then we want to take a look at what are some options for us to help people get more connected. So what do we do? So I'm going to lay out five ways to change. Again, these are not necessarily easy to do, uh, and they are kind of in depth. So this is more of a, a, a teaser today. And if you are interested in joining us for the five week session, I definitely encourage you to join. But these are ways that we can it, change our measure of loneliness and improve connection. And then of course, our overall health and wellness. So our first step, our first way to change uh, is going to be to problem solve any barriers that we have to connecting with others, finding resources for those. So for example, uh, there might be transportation issues as Bonnie mentioned. So are there drivers that can take you? And of course in the pandemic, that's a little bit more complicated, uh, you know, of, of finding a volunteer driver, someone who can drive us. Um, it could be an issue of, can you hear, you know, like people who have hearing loss, that's a barrier to connecting with other people. So are there resources that we can do to help folks out with that? Of course, with the pandemic, we've all been physically distancing from each other, hopefully a little bit less as things improve, knock on wood, uh, but we've, we've been separated. And so that has increased loneliness. So how have we been able to over the course of this past year, stay connected virtually in other ways with our loved ones? It may also be a matter of are there resources for people to connect and gather together? So that could be uh, group exercise or um, support groups uh, or quilt groups or card games. You know, a lot of those things got put on hold with the pandemic. So what what is going on now? If there are virtual sessions kind of like this one, do people have the ability to connect to those? So those are some things that we want to take a look at first before we dig into some other things. But then we do want to take a look at those perception changes. So we start by first identifying that we have thoughts and emotions that influence our perspective of a situation. So, so here's a little flow sheet that kind of illustrates that. A situation happens and we interpret that with a thought. And then that thought also is connected with a feeling. And then that influences what we do. And so if I am uh, walking down the hallway and someone, I smile at a coworker, well, <laughs> you know, masking, it's harder to do now. But if I try to kind of give a smile with my eyes and I get no response back from her, then I might interpret that negatively. And I might personalize that and say, well, what did I do wrong? As opposed to perhaps there's another reason why she didn't engage with me. Perhaps she was distracted or having a tough day. So my interpretation is going to influence what I do. Maybe I won't try to engage with her next time if I think it's my fault, or maybe I will try again if I think maybe it's not, not me. And so we take a look at this first. How are we interpreting the situations that we're in? And are there shifts that we can make to help that be more helpful to us? So the next step is to look at what are our tools in our toolbox for relaxing our bodies? Now, if we think about engaging with other people, a lot of times social anxiety is a component of that. We get tense, we get nervous. I think a lot of us have started to feel this as well with the pandemic. We're out of touch, we're out of practice with being around other people. I mean, even going to a meal out, you know, I'm not used to it anymore. So I might have some heightened anxiety with doing something like that again. And so do we have tools that help us relax our bodies so that we can better engage in those types of activities? So a couple of options that I would run through with people it might be deep breathing, deep breathing from your diaphragm, which is from your belly. So you can practice this by putting your hand on your belly. And as you're breathing in, your hand should move outwards. That's how we know that it's a good deep diaphragm breath. So doing those deep breaths helps reduce the stress and tension in our bodies. 
There's also progressive muscle relaxation. So you'll see the image here on the screen of the person lying on the ground. You can also do this sitting, but the idea is that we start usually at the tops of our heads and go through different types of body parts and we tense them and then we release them. So we're, we're tensing, not to the point of pain, but we're tensing the muscles and then releasing the muscles to invite relaxation into our bodies. And these are very portable skills that we can use in any situation to kind of cut down on that level of stress to help us be more present in the moment. Now, another step is to take a look at what are our positive inputs in our lives? So this gets into a type of approach which is called behavioral activation. You'll see this flow chart here where what often happens with folks who are depressed, who are lonely, isolated, that's a very challenging situation to be in. It increases our um, feelings of hopelessness and helplessness. And then that decreases our energy and motivation. So you see this unfortunate negative cycle where then we're more inactive because of those things, which then increases those negative mental states. So what one strategy that we can use is to try to break out of that pattern through behavioral activation, which is basically how can we add more activities, more positive inputs into our day that help us feel that we're being productive, that we tackled something, did something that we can feel good about, which again gets into a different cycle, which is much more positive and reinforcing in a good way. So. I work with a lot of people on setting behavioral activation goals. And of course, the, this can be specifically related to loneliness, like, hey, can we figure out how to call up a friend and to meet up for a coffee date? But it could also be, can we work on helping you get out of bed before noon every day, if that's a struggle for you? Because, you know, by sleeping in for so long, you're missing out on a lot of opportunities to feel good about yourself. So little strategies, little steps that we take here of, you know, we're not going to jump from I'm waking up at noon every day to I'm waking up bright and early at eight in the morning. It might be small steps with a lot of positive reinforcement and self-encouragement. And that's how we start to see behaviors change. So the final step that I take a look at with folks is it's all well and good to say, okay, let's figure out how we can connect with people. What are the resources? Um, let's, you know, meet people or, or try something new. Um, but we don't want to neglect the existing relationships that we have. In fact, most of the people that I work with who say that they're lonely have relationships. They have people in their lives, but those relationships are negative or not reinforcing in some way. And so there's lots of strategies that we can use to improve those relationships. So there's different strategies like Dear Man. This is a very uh, popular skill in the therapy world um, where we can explore how to get what we want out of a relationship. So are there things that we can do to um, describe the issue and ask for a change in some way? Give is another skill that helps us just be um, more open in relationships and kind of foster good good feelings between two people. Um, and then I also go back to the love languages. So we all have different ways that we send and receive love to each other. And um, that could be physical touch, you know, which I know a lot of us have been lacking in the pandemic, um, but that's a love language. It could be words of affirmation between people. So we take a look at these types of things to say, okay, what are your needs? What are the other person's needs? Needs, and how can we help people make the and you know send those messages of love to each other? So, I ran through a lot of ideas there, and again, we spend hours <laughs> digging in through some of these. So if you're interested in more information, I encourage you to join us for our loneliness series through my Michigan Health. But what I hope that you hear is that belonging and connectedness are key to your health. Loneliness is changeable, it's curable. We just wanna find the right tools to do that. And thank you so much for your time.
Man, thank you so much, Megan. I wrote down all five of those uh, teaser ways to change, like you said, and I would, man, I would love to take that course. You said it's five weeks, right? It is. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's all free. <laughs> <laughs> that helps too. And man, and wow, you have such a soothing voice. So I'd love to sit up under you for five weeks. I think that helps as well. So thank you so much, Megan. We appreciate you. Okay. Thank you. All right, so our final speaker today is Dr. Mayor Jundi, who is going to discuss the need to address health concerns early, lest they set, up, set you up for poor health in the future. We don't want that. So Dr. Jundi is a health fail, a failure specialist who is board certified in cardiovascular disease through the American Board of Internal Medicine. Uh, he has been with Covenant for 11 years and is the medical director for Covenant Medical Group Cardiology, Dr. Jundi. Good morning. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, women's and heart diseases. Heart diseases continue to be the leading cause in death in the United States, and particularly coronary artery diseases. So coronary artery diseases are the diseases that cause blockages of the coronary arteries, and that can lead to heart attacks. Now, there are subtle differences between the symptoms uh, in the symptoms between men and women. Generally speaking, women present 10 years older than men with the symptoms of heart attacks. And that can sometimes give them the dif different concepts of the disease. Women in general tend to have something called atypical symptoms. For example, everybody knows chest pain is a symptom of a heart attack. In women, they tend to have sometimes, not all the time, fatigue they can have shortness of breath, they can have a chest pressure that might not be explained or referred to as a heart attack symptoms. Also, the trigger of the symptoms in females or women in general tend to be a little different sometimes. So they tend to have symptoms at rest or when they are asleep or sometimes due to emotional stress. As this is a little bit different than men. Why I'm saying that? Because when obtaining the history of a female patient, when they mentioned that I had the symptoms during my sleep or during an argument, it tend to be explained as stress-related symptoms. So we have higher percentage of women leaving emergency department without making the right diagnosis of a heart attack. And that's why, or this is one of the symptoms or the manifestations of uh, silent heart attack in females. Females tend to have higher rate of silent heart attacks comparing to men. And that will lead to higher percentage of heart failures. Of course, coronary artery disease is one of the leading cause for heart failure because of multiple heart attacks. Now, the issue here is really looking at the risk factors for coronary artery disease. So in men and women, they share the risk, same risk factors such as hypertension, diabetes, smoking, uh, lack of activities. But talking about hypertension per se, especially in African American population, they tend to have a higher rate of high blood pressure in females. And they tend to start earlier in life. So younger females have higher percentage of having hypertension comparing to the general population. Early treatment for, heart, for high blood pressure is very important to decrease the risk of heart attacks and coronary heart disease in everybody, especially in females. So paying attention to the symptoms, paying attention to the risk factors is very important. And early treatment, visiting physicians more often, exercise, decreasing weight, all of these things are very important to do in order to prevent heart attacks and complications of heart attacks, as I stated, like heart failure. So taking a charge of your health early on in life will lead to decrease of complications in the future. There is tendency to think that females less than 45 years old don't have heart diseases, and that's a mistake. They tend to have that. We've seen, I've seen in my office many times, younger females coming with heart failure because of uncontrolled hypertension that's been going on for 10, 15 years, they will tell you that we started medication at age 16 
I got bored of taking medication. I'm too young to take medications. And they end up with hypertensive heart disease, and then it will go into heart failure. We don't want to forget also other manifestations for uh, heart diseases. For example, the broken heart syndrome, they tend to be way higher in females than men. Also, there are certain manifestations for heart diseases that don't happen in men. For example, peripartum cardiomyopathy, weakness of the heart can occur during a pregnancy or after a pregnancy. So any subtle symptoms, any symptoms that women might think is related to stress and could be related to stress, it's very important to talk to the primary care physician in order to get the appropriate examinations and the appropriate testing in order to prevent the problems in the future. So women have to advocate for themselves. They have to realize that these symptoms are there. They might not be related to stress. They might not be related to anything else. Yes, it could be different than men, but women tend to present differently. So I will take these symptoms very seriously and talk to the primary care physician or to the specialist about it before making the judgment that uh, this is a stress-related or this is something we kind of brush off. Overall, the risk factors for men and women continue to be the same. So taking a charge of your health early on in life, uh, not minimizing the risk of hypertension, high blood pressure, smoking, and lack of activities. Uh, start early in life to prevent major problems in the future. A few cases I've had in my practice of younger females who have had high blood pressure or diabetes at a young age. And that was not treated appropriately because, uh, as I stated before, they thought this is something simple. High, high blood pressure, of course, doesn't hurt. This is why it's called the silent killer, because the first presentation of hypertension could be heart attack, could be stroke, could be renal failure. So they add to that, unfortunately, what comes with young age, smoking, alcohol abuse. And at early, uh, their early 30s, they start having symptoms of heart failure. Of course, going back a track and treating the high blood pressure is a little bit too late. We're already having a major problem to deal with. We do start the treatment, but some of those patients ended up with a heart transplant in, in their 40s. So this is why I'm saying it's very important to start early in life. High blood pressure doesn't hurt. That is correct. But high blood pressure is a major risk factor for heart diseases with blockages of the artery or without the blockages of the artery. Add to that inactivity, add to that obesity, add to that other uh, behavioral issues such as drug or alcohol abuse. And very early in life, the patient have to deal with the problem. Usually we see it in patients in their 80s and 90s. So it's very, very important to take these risk factors seriously and get appropriate treatment. It is not normal to have a high blood pressure in the early 20s and not managing it. Yes, it will not hurt, but the price will be paid later on. I, I am not a nutritionist, but I can tell you, balanced diet is very important. Counting calories. And we know from the literature that doing diet by itself, no matter what diet you choose to do, is not enough. Doing exercise by itself without appropriate diet is also not enough. Diet and exercise must go hand in hand. It has been documented many times in the literature that whatever diet you do, it should be decreased calories. That's number one. And you must couple it with exercise activities and you will see results. Thank you so much, Dr. Jundi. Wow, you've shown us that prevention really is the key to avoiding larger issues down the road, uh, for sure. So obesity, uh, diabetes, smoking, and high blood pressure are all factors that can lead to heart disease and stroke. And the American Heart Association's goal is to change the culture of health and to make the healthy choice the easy choice. Uh, imagine if every person joining us today made a pledge to change just one daily habit, maybe to drink more water, I'm on that. 
three of these a day for me, <laughs> or spend more time outdoors, uh, go for a walk, make time to relax and recharge, or to be more mindful of what we're eating. That's very important. Imagine if each of us were committed to make these changes habits. How many people might we influence? How many people that we love might we uh, may also make healthier choices because of the choices we're making? Imagine the positive health impact on the Great Lakes Bay Health Area if each person, each of us, helps move the needle on positive health outcomes. Uh, once again, we wanna thank the MidMichigan Health for uh, powering today's event as a sponsor. And of course, to our absolutely fabulous speakers. Man, so good. Uh, most importantly, thank you for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed yourself. Uh, we hope that you heard something today that will leave a lasting impact. I know I did. Uh, and if you heard something that inspired you, remember, please share your experience on social media using hashtag GoRedTalks with an S. Be well and enjoy your afternoon. <laughs>